I mean, I think that the, the timing of this review comes after three big uncertainties were resolved. And in that sense, the timing is, is exactly right. Uh, that uh, we, we know what the Brexit settlement is and a real sense of, uh, I think, comes across in, in the integrated review document that this is a post-Brexit review with a new focus on sovereignty as one of the three core interests alongside prosperity and security. Uh, it's the right timing because it comes after uh, the, uh, Joe Biden's victory in the American election. And clearly quite a bit of the text is informed uh, by the messages that are already coming out of the White House, very high priority on climate, uh, much more positive attitude towards multilateralism. But there's also quite a, quite a sense of the need to work with, with other medium powers Although uh, the document doesn't self-describe the UK as a medium power, it comes across, I think, loud and clear that uh, bas the basic the principle of this document is that the UK is a medium power, maybe a top tier medium power. And then thirdly, the deal for defence, uh, which is significantly better in financial terms than the manifesto promised, and even more importantly, it's a four year deal. And until that financial settlement was in place in November, the defence side of this integrated review, of course, got, wouldn't be, uh, couldn't have been completed. So, of course, we don't know whether on the defence side, the sums will truly add up uh, once uh, uh, the services get into it and all the much more detailed work is done. And historically, there's often a, uh, it, the, it looks as if the books are balanced when the review comes out and then it slips away in the years subsequently. It feels to me in broad terms, the defence review uh, looks to focus on capabilities for intense, short and sharp war fighting with highly capable adversaries at the top end, more on countering grey area threats, as they're called, more low intensity capabilities at a, at a low, lower end and often non-military capabilities. But where it sacrifices is in the mass needed for sustained operations. It will be harder to do another Helmand, for example, with an army that has been significantly reduced in size. And clearly, and I'm sure people want to talk more about this, uh, the, the announcement next week by Ben Wallace will uh, show that there will be a smaller front line across all three services, but especially the army. Maybe the most innovative aspect of this review is it says, says much more about technology and its key role domestically and internationally. So this feels very different from the 2015 review. The Prime Minister said our international ambitions must start at home. And I think this talks both to a, a view that technological competition with China in particular is more important than military competition is going to define the 21st century uh, between the West and China, but there's a strong UK dimension. And also I think speaks to a very different approach to domestic industrial policy. The need to be competitive in the title is most of all about technology. And a central theme in the report is a need for commercialization, which the UK is historically very bad at. So, in terms of that, more emphasis on technology actually feels to me more French than we've uh, traditionally uh, seen ourselves in this country. It's a, a, a move, maybe a, 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 a course uh, alteration rather than a radical shift, but nevertheless an alteration towards a more activist industrial policy as a key component of foreign policy. I have four big questions that then I. Uh, leaving some of the big issues to, to my colleagues. But four big questions really jumped out to me from this report, which I don't think it addressed adequately. The first, the most obvious one, is that very big cut in the order budget announced by the Chancellor last November. I, I think the only reference in the document I certainly saw was the Prime Minister saying that he intended to cut, reverse that cut when fiscal circumstances allow, which of course could be a very long time indeed. Uh, but the, the integrated review was written as if the cut in order did not take place. It's full of examples of 
the success of Britain aid, British aid in recent years before the cut had taken place. Uh, but the cut in order between 2019 and 2021 will be around 35%. And because that cut is due to start, has already started as of January this year, so the 0.5% refers to calendar year 2021. Uh, I think we're going to find by the end of this calendar year, by the end of 2021, the cuts will have to be even bigger. And because the cuts uh, <coughs> are commitments to multilateral organizations like the UN and the World Bank are scheduled in advance, the cuts in bilateral aid are going to be even bigger. And uh, I think one of the things which I believe the government needs to do is they need to produce an equivalent for aid to the defense command paper. So the defense command paper is going to give us a detail as to uh, where this extra money for defense is going to go. The government does need an aid command paper or equivalent setting out uh, how it proposes uh, to uh, reduce uh, the aid budget in a way which is strategically informed and not just based on where cuts can be made. Clearly a big area of controversy uh, uh, in Parliament. The second question is on trade. I mean, I think in many ways, the, 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 perhaps for understandable reasons, very little on where we're going uh, with uh, the European Union, uh, how far the pessimistic projections of trade reductions will come through. But I think uh, for this review, what's also important, what Rick, I think, came through rather strongly to me was this, the position on China uh, it, it still uh, tries to maintain a balance between greater strategic competition with China on the one hand, but also, if anything, increased dependence on China uh, for trade and investment. And certainly if the UK wants a significant economic shift towards the Indo-Pacific, then it's hard to see how that can be achieved without uh, increased uh, economic interdependence with China playing a really important role. Third, my third point would be in relation to the EU. In, in a way, I think that given the, the politics, uh, the fraught politics of our relationship with the European Union at this very moment, the very uh, the, the most one could ask for perhaps is that the, the review leaves a placeholder open for uh, greater security and, and defense cooperation with the European Union in the future. And I think it does that, it doesn't rule that out. And then finally, there is, I think, a question mark about the Middle East. Uh, there's, I think, on the military capability, Peter may talk about this, a question about what will have to be cut to make room for the increment in, in, in deployments uh, to the Indo-Pacific region, to the, to the, Indo, the Asia-Pacific in particular. And there's a really interesting uh, sentence which talks about the Middle East and Gulf primarily in terms of trade and science and technology collaboration, and then talks about supporting, I quote, a more resilient region that is increasingly self-reliant in providing for its own security. So that seems to mirror the rather strong messages we're getting from the White House uh, about the US also pivoting away from the Middle East uh, towards the Asia Pacific. And I think we'll hear more about that in the days to come. So